What is community? That's a great question, uh, especially since it's in our church sign, which says Grace Community Church. What does it mean to be in community uh, with some other people? We don't want to be accused of false advertising around here. So when we advertise that we are a church of community, Grace Community, what exactly does that mean? We think that's pretty critical around here. And so for the next few weeks, so we're going to look at that. What does it mean to be in community? Uh, Why should we be in community? What difference does it make? We're going to examine those questions over the next few weeks. And so uh, this morning, I just want us to start off with uh, looking at Hebrews uh, chapter 10. Now, when you read Hebrews, uh, you got to understand that this book is written to some people who are struggling with their faith. Uh, they're, They're experiencing persecution. Some of them... Uh, are falling away from the faith. Some of them are compromising their faith. Some of them are losing faith. It's not easy for them in the time in which they're living to be faithful to Jesus Christ. And so the letter of Hebrews is written to them to encourage them to be faithful. All right, so listen to what it says. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. He's saying, don't give up, guys. Hang in there. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The writer of Hebrews says to them, let's not give up the habit of meeting together. Now listen, when he's writing this group of Christians, he's not talking about meetings like we're having here where there's a whole bunch of us, hundreds of us gathered in one place. He's writing to people who are having meetings in their homes uh, where they are spurring one another on towards love and good deeds. He's saying, listen guys, don't give up the habit of meeting together. And I don't think he's concerned with their eating habits. I don't think he's concerned necessarily with what they're doing on the weekends or how many friends they have. He's simply saying, guys, the only way you're going to make this is together. The only way you're going to be able to be faithful to Jesus Christ is if you live life together. The only way you're going to experience the fullness of the Christian life is if you live life together. Don't give up the habit of meeting together. We are created uh, to live life together in community. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, some things in us immediately change. Uh, When we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, our relationship with God was immediately changed in just that moment. When we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our eternal destiny changed right then and there. When we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit came to live within us. Those things happened instantly. But when you accepted Christ, your whole life didn't change yet, did it? I mean, you still had some areas to grow in as far as uh, being a husband, a father, a son, a daughter, uh, and how you relate to your coworkers and your spiritual life. You still had some room to grow, some areas where you could go further in your faith. For that reason, the Bible says when we accept Christ, the Bible calls it being born again. We start fresh. Uh, You're born again as a child, and you begin to grow into that life that Christ has given to you. Being saved isn't like being spayed or neutered. You don't come home fixed, all right? You come home with a fixer. You come home to a new life, but it's a new life that you are now placed into a family so that you can grow into that new life. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says, don't give up the habit of meeting together. This is not, a, this is not an option for the Christian life. He doesn't say to them, hey guys, now that you guys are saved, go back to your own life and we'll see each other in heaven. Because he knows if they do that, if they miss the community aspect of this, they're going to miss the life that God desires to give to them today. My, uh, my younger brother's name is Tommy, and y'all have already heard me talk a little bit about him, but Tommy took the long road, like some of you did too. Y'all know what I'm talking about. He took the long road to faithfulness in Christ, and, and he and I had talked, and, and throughout his life, because God, had, uh, God wanted to use Tommy in such a special way, and, and, uh, but Tommy kept doing crazy stuff. He kept telling me over and over, Jeff, I'm still building my testimony. And I'd say, Tommy, your testimony's good enough, man. Stop. It's good enough. All right? But he kept being. So one day he called me up and he said, Jeff, he said, man, I, I, I'm back where I was. 
He said, you know what? I mean, I accepted Christ again. And this was like for the 80th time. He kept reaccepting Christ. thinking he hadn't done it right the first time. He said, man, you know, I did it again. And man, I really committed it. I was serious this time. Man, I committed my life to Christ. But I want to tell you something. Nothing's changing. Nothing's changing. And I said, uh, Tommy, the problem with you is not your commitment uh, to Christ. I said, you're, you're sincere in your commitment to Christ. The problem is you don't understand how God has called you to live. And, and, I, asked, and I told him this. I said, Tommy, if you, if you took a newborn baby, a healthy newborn baby child, and you stuck it out in the field, and you came back a week later to check on it, what would you find? Baby would be dead, right? And you would stand there and go, what's wrong with this baby? <laughs> why, why didn't the baby, you know, he was a perfectly healthy baby. What's wrong with the baby? There's nothing wrong with the baby. It's something that the baby was meant to be placed in a family where it could be cared for and nurtured and supported and loved. That's how babies grow. They don't grow outside of a family. They're placed in that family for a good reason. And when you and I accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become children of God. We don't come as full-grown adults into this family. We become children of God, and we are placed in the family, and that family is not optional for us either. Well, for one time in my little brother's life, he listened to me. Uh, all those other times I didn't get through, but I, he listened to me, and he got involved in a church called New Life. We have a campus here in Fort Smith. He was involved in the one in Little Rock. He got involved with New Life got put into a small group with some guys, um, and uh, his life changed. Uh, and, and, and we saw just the most dramatic change in his life over that next couple of years as he lived life with some other people in the family of God. Uh, he's now the pastor at a church uh, outside of Little Rock that's making disciples of Jesus Christ and changing people's lives in the most amazing of ways, all because he discovered how life was truly meant to be lived and that it wasn't meant to be lived outside of family. We all need that family, that community, that place where we are known by other people, where people can spur us on to becoming who God has called us to be outside of that we don't become the people that God has created us to be. We all need that kind of family. And that's why community is so important for us. Outside of it, we'll never experience life. And some of you are wondering why life's not working. Some of you, are, you know, you've made the commitment. Maybe you're reading your Bible. Maybe you're coming to church. Maybe you're doing all the right things. You stopped doing the stuff you weren't supposed to be doing. And you started doing some things that you were supposed to be doing. And yet life still doesn't feel like it's working. There's no joy. There's no peace. You're not, you're not experiencing that, that joy-filled, abundant, powerful, supernatural life that God desires to give to you. And it's possible that there's nothing wrong with your motivation. There's nothing wrong with, with, with the, simply the commitment that you made to Christ. It's simply you don't understand that God designed for you to live in family. That's the only way we thrive. It's the only way we grow is in family, and all of us need it. And listen, it's not just about us either. Uh, we need family because we need each other. I went grocery shopping last night. Uh, I, had, I, I couldn't go to my harps uh, because they didn't have it at my harps, so I had to look around a little bit. If I can get this cooler open. Is there a trick to it? Whoop! Top. Top right. Top right. That button. Man, I'm glad this is family. This would be embarrassing if it wasn't family. All right, this is what I went shopping for right here. Uh, I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with this is. This is a cow tongue. Uh, and, and there's, this is a hell, I mean, this is a good looking cow tongue right here. Uh, it's formed well. Uh, it's got all the taste buds in there. It's still floppy. You can just imagine uh, what this cow tongue would be like. And I want you to know uh, that, that uh, there's only one problem with this cow tongue. All right, can y'all identify what the one problem with the cow tongue is? It's disconnected from the cow. That's right, and this cow tongue, disconnected from the cow, lacks some purpose. I mean, there's certain things going on here that are not working real well outside of where it was designed to be. And we should feel sorry for this. 
because outside of this, it will never understand <laughs> what it was meant to do. So this cow tongue is in a great degree lost. But you ought to feel sorry for the cow too, <laughs> right? Think about the cow. I mean, this is not an optional part to a cow's life. This is an important part of a cow's life. And with this gone, that cow is in trouble. In fact, some of y'all may be having him for lunch today. <laughs> right? This is not an optional piece. Listen, some of you are living just like this. All right? This, this I mean, symbolically, <laughs> <laughs> describes your life. You're living outside of real community where people know you. All right? And so your purposes are not being fully experienced this way. But listen, the same thing goes for there's a cow somewhere, a group of people who are missing what you would bring to that group. And yet a lot of Christians are living like this, and then they're wondering why life doesn't work out. And why is it my life? Why am I experiencing power and all those kinds of things uh, that God wants me to experience? Now, we'll see who's the first person to shake my hand uh, <laughs> after worship today. Listen, Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 16 puts it this way. Uh, let's see. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. From him, he's speaking Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. All right, this is how it works. This is how the body grows as each supporting ligament, as each supporting part, as each part does its work. All right, it grows and builds itself in love as each part does its work. How does the body grow? As each part does its work. You and I are created to live in community. The same way that God designed the cow tongue to exist inside the cow. That's where it discovers its purpose. That's where it operates most fully. It allows the whole body to grow together. That's the way that you and I were designed to live. When we live outside of that, we live outside of God's design for our lives. And we experience far less than God wants or desires for any of us. Harvard, uh, Harvard did a, a study that I thought was pretty neat when I read about it. Uh, they went to some elementary schools and they told the teachers that they had designed a test that could identify which children were going to make great academic progress that year. And, and so they gave all the kids a test. Then they took that test, they wadded it up and they threw it away. And they took five children from at random on the roll and they went back and told the teacher, these five children are really going to make academic progress this year. And these kids are, you know, our tests show that they're really going to surge forward academically. And so that year, poor little Johnny never could go back to his old ways because the teacher kept calling on him. The teacher kept holding him accountable. The teacher kept asking those kids to do more. The teacher kept believing. And when she looked at them, these kids are going to make great academic progress. And so she kept asking questions. They kept pushing them. They kept saying, you can do better than this. They kept lovingly drawing them forward, drawing out the very best in them. And guess what happened at the end of that academic year to those children who had been identified to the teachers as making, making tremendous academic progress that year? Can you guess what happened to them? They made tremendous academic progress that year. Uh, let me ask you this. What would happen if you were placed in a family of people who thought you were special? A people who thought you were a child of God, created by God, before the, uh, that God just created you to do good works, that God created you to do supernatural things that would change the world around you? What if God placed you in that kind of family? And what if that family believed that you were more called and more equipped uh, and more able than you had ever dared to believe that you were? And what if that family kept calling on you? What if that family kept counting on you? Uh, what if that family kept spurring you on toward love and good deeds? What if that family kept encouraging and, and supporting in every way that they could, believing that you were called to shine like the stars in the universe? What do you think would happen to your life? You think that'd make a difference? I do. Because I think it's the way that God designed each and every one of us to live. Surrounded by family that pushes us, and encourages us, and draws us forward to the life that God has called us to live. In fact, that's the only way 
I believe we operate to in, in, within our design. I'm a whole lot dumber than I was 16 years ago when I was in seminary. Man, when I was in seminary, I had things figured out. I mean, I, about parenting, uh, marriage, divorce, whatever you name it, life in the church, I had everything figured out. And then, then you get in people, and things get confusing, and life gets more difficult in those kinds of situations. And so a lot of things I, I'm less sure of than I was uh, when I was in seminary. But this I believe more than ever. Only in community. When we're around some people who know us, when we're around some people who encourage us, when we're around some people who know our greatest joys and our deepest struggles, it's only in community that we become the people that God has called us to be. In fact, the church in America today is but a shadow of what God has called us to be. Because so often what happens at church is anything but community. And lots of churches that have community in their name don't live out community in the life of the body together. In fact, for many people, the neighborhood bar is a far greater sense and, and symbol of community than what they experience in church on Sunday. When you walk in and you say, how are you doing? And how are you doing? I'm fine. How's it going? Great, great. Marriage, wonderful. You know, right? We're all fine. That's why we're here, right? We're fine. I'm fine. You're fine. Everything's great. <laughs> Praise God. That's what we come to do, man. Just, you know, just love him. <laughs> and, and what happens is, is that slowly over time, we begin to live in debilitating isolation from one another. And we wonder why life's not working out when the truth is that we're living outside of God's design for us. And because of this, because we're in isolation from one another, we become increasingly vulnerable to the enemy's attacks. We become increasingly vulnerable to compromising our faith and our beliefs in the life that God has called us to live. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says these words, it says, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I like to watch, like, nature documentary shows. Um, I, that's the kind of stuff I like. And if you ever watch those nature documentary shows, you, you see that the lion is prowling around uh, this little herd of antelope. And you see one of the antelope... Uh, kind of wanders a little astray from the rest of the herd. Y'all know it? And when the little antelope, unsuspecting antelope, wanders away from the rest of the herd, the music changes. Kind of like Jaws. Da-dum, da-dum, da-dum. And the lion begins to come closer and closer because what does the lion do on the nature shows? He looks for the ones that get separated from the crowd. And when one gets separated from the crowd, then he pounces on that one. And, and I wonder if the writer of this scripture wasn't thinking of maybe, maybe of that scenario right there. How the devil prowls around on the edges of the Christian community just looking for those who are living in isolation from other people. Outside of God's design where we're weak and where we're vulnerable. It's in the secrecy of isolation that pornography grows into an addiction. It's in the secrecy of isolation that eating disorders become life-threatening. It's in the secrecy of isolation that we betray our spouses and our family and our friends. It's in the secrecy of isolation that we compromise our morals and our ethics and our beliefs. It happens when we get isolated from people. When we live outside of our design, we become vulnerable. God designed us for family. It's the only way we operate. It goes against the, the American ideal because in America, we like to think we're independent. We don't need anybody. I can do it all by myself, right? Don't need anybody. Uh, that's the American ideal for every young man who grew up watching Clint Eastwood and John Wayne movies. I don't need anybody. We've turned that into a virtue in America today. The only problem is it goes against everything the Bible teaches us about how you and I are called to live. You and I are called to live in community. 
There's no way around it. It's not a cool new fad, small groups. Uh, it's, a, it's the way the Bible designed us to live. And outside of this, we will always be less. How are you going to live? That's what we're going to think about the next few weeks. How are you going to live? Are you going to live with community, with some people who know you and love you and support you and encourage you and spur you on? Or are you going to live outside of that community? Do you think you can do it by yourself? Who is that family that surrounds you, uh, that believes in you, that's counting on you, that's calling on you? Do you have that family? If not, are you willing to discover that family? Who are we going to be as a church? What kind of church are we going to be? Are we going to be a church where community is really experienced? Or are we going to be like so many other churches in our world today where people come to worship and have a great worship experience? You know, great band, hopefully a sermon with some funny stories, and everybody goes home thinking, I did my church thing. You know, and you go back home and you go back to your own life. And listen, if you have a good band and you have some decent preaching and you got friendly people, you can grow the church. All right, that's, that's not the problem. we got a cool band. Great lights. I mean, it's kind of fun. You know what? We can grow people coming into a space like this. That's not hard. We won't change the world. We won't experience the joy and the peace and the life that God has for us. But we'll have a big church, and that would be cool. Uh, but we'll be far less than who God has called us to be. If we as a church don't become what our sign says that we are, a place where people discover community. I can't make that happen. You can't make that happen by yourself. If we're going to become that place, it's going to take all of us. Believing this, this is how God designed us. Uh, this is how we're called to live. It's going to take all of us moving in that direction so that we become the people that God has called us to be. And if you're interested in how to do that, that's what we're going to talk about for the next couple of weeks. What does that mean? What does that look like? What's that going to ask of all of us? Well, that's the question we're asking over these next couple of weeks. Are you ready to go on that journey to become a place where community is not just a part of the sign, but it's a way of life? Because that's how I believe that God has called each and every one of us to live.